brain. You know, when I was taking biochemistry, you know, 20, 22 years ago, we, we were taught it was ketones. You know, the, the, your brain optimally runs on ketones. It pre preferentially runs on ketones, especially when you're in a, in a so-called fasting state, which I, I argue is not a fasting state. I argue that that's our primary metabolic state. Mm -hmm. That's the metabolic state of most animals in the wild. If you look at them. Yeah, that's our natural state. Our natural state isn't okay. putting something in our mouth. I am putting together a session and, and it's all about the changes in human diets over, you know, our ancestor diets um, over these periods of evolution. Uh, and, and I want you to talk about the brain acting as a hybrid. And in my preparation for this talk, I found uh, a paper that had been published in like the most dynamite anthropology journals, the Journal of Human Evolution, I think it was called. I don't really remember, but it's their really great journal that everyone wants to publish in. And in that article, I found two, it was all about how the Neanderthal diet and the development of the brain. And they had two comments in there both of which reflected a profound ignorance by stating that d dietary carbohydrates are essential and were essential to our ancestors mm. in the development of their brain. And I actually cited that article and then I just kind of hopefully tactfully just said, this is wrong. Um, and, and then shared with them a quote by the National Academy of Sciences in the US stating that the lower limit of carbohydrates in the human diet is zero. Yeah. In other words, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. And the whole the idea that the human brain evolved because our ancestors ate a lot of carbs, that's utterly ridiculous. And that's basically the impression I gave the audience, hopefully not too offensively. But I had many, many people come up to me afterwards, very, very grateful. Um, maybe the, the haters and the detractors didn't bother coming up, but no one said, no, no one uttered a negative word. It was just absolute gratitude at learning this reality of human biology and physiology, which is that, yes, it, it's because they mistake dietary carbohydrates with blood glucose. That right. it appears, what does appear to be the case is that the brain has some demand for some glucose. That appears to be accurate, although the lower limit is unknown early work by a, a fasting physiologist named George Cahill, he was putting people's glucose down to like 20 milligrams per deciliter, which most people would say, you're unconscious, you're in a coma and you're going to die. And these people, because they'd been long-term fast adapted, which I would say ketone adapted, there appeared to be no deficit to cognition. I mean, that's a pretty bloody low level of, of glucose. But nevertheless, let's kind of grant that side of it that the brain has some requirement for some glucose. Well, it is a minimal requirement because if you take a body that has five millimolar glucose and you start increasing the ketones to one or two or even three millimolar, which is still less than the five millimolar of glucose. So there's still less of the ketone in the blood than there is the glucose. By then the brain has already dramatically shifted its energy use. And even though the ketone may be less than half of what the glucose is in the blood, it's now providing double you know, twice as much of energy to the brain as the glucose is. So if the brain has any preferential fuel, it is absolutely for the ketone. You can take a newborn baby and the baby can breastfeed or bottle feed. And then within an hour, the baby is in a deeper state of ketosis than an adult would be after fasting for 20, uh, for, for a full day. You know, and, and I mean, so if, if there's any natural state, kind of back to our conversation a moment ago, it is clearly that a natural state is a state of ketosis.